Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Illustration Department Podcast. I am your host, Giuseppe Castellano. In this podcast, I talk to folks in illustration, animation, and other creative fields about their beginnings, their successes, and the bumps and bruises they've experienced along the way. In this episode, I talk to Mohammed Danawi. In 1988, Mohammed had to flee his hometown of Tripoli during a violent civil war in Lebanon. He went on to become the founder and creative director of Illozoo, an agency that represents the best in illustration. Among other topics, Mohammed and I talk about the renaissance we see in illustration. He takes us through the steps on how one can form and run an agency. And he offers illustrators advice from the perspective of an agent. I hope you enjoy our conversation. As you know, there are dozens, more than dozens of podcasts out there with that speak to similar similar subjects. But it's it's you know it's something that we're 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 obviously just starting out doing, and um, we'll see where it goes for sure. Yeah, but it's good that you're also focusing on different issues, like you know, there's the struggles and and giving advice, and it's not only the glamorous uh, oh, yeah. topic. I want to talk a little bit more about some of the more frustrating parts of it. The behind the scenes stuff. Exactly. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> sure. I wanted to, as a sort of uh, thinking about how I'm going to introduce this podcast, I still, I'm still thinking about it. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to say something along the lines of, you know, illuminate the corn, illuminate the darker corners of illustration. But I felt, I felt a way, you know, I looked at Sarah and she was like, she, I could see her shaking darker her head. Like, corners. Nope, Nope. That does. <laughs> Darker corner. Yeah, it seems like a mysterious dark corners. Yeah, but exactly. In, in a way, you, you could, it's sort of like a balance between sort of the behind the scene, what you really want to talk about, maybe like um, the struggles and and the, to achieve success and all the steps that, you know, the rejections uh, and then the success that illustrators or even artists, commercial artists go through. And I guess, you know, maybe how things are changing in terms of marketing and communication, how this is affecting competition, that, uh, you know, people could start to learn from this, those lessons, from the struggles and from the failure and, and you know, kind of push themselves towards more successful path, I guess, in a more positive way. We're going to get there. We're definitely going to talk about that. But before we talk about that, let's... So take me back. So try to try to um, rebuild, if you will, your beginning. So can I just ask, like, where where are you from? So originally, my parents are from Lebanon, a tiny country east of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I left Lebanon during the war, civil war, uh, in eighty eight, and I uh, went to France first. I lived in France. I studied there for a year. Then I went to Montreal in Canada, uh, and uh, I still go there every year to Lebanon to visit my family, but I established myself in Montreal, um, and sort of now I think I, three quarter of my life was spent outside Lebanon, and so now I consider myself a combination of different cultures, Lebanese, Canadian, and U.S. citizen. I'm a U.S. citizen, I mean, I guess been living here for a uh, 23 uh, years uh, and my children are from all over they're Italian Lebanese Canadian and then British Moroccan Lebanese so <laughs> we're all over the world that's great there's a combination of, of countries and cultures I can't think of anything more American honestly <laughs> exactly <laughs> Yeah, so that's where I'm from. I assume growing up you were drawing, you were interested in art? Yeah, I mean, of course. In uh, in Lebanon, uh, I grew up there and uh, up until uh, high school. Uh, and I was mainly uh, in high school focusing on the creative, uh, like the visual art part. We had like different baccalaureates to take and each baccalaureate uh, is focused on one you know track so there's a scientific baccalaureate literal literature oriented philosophy literature and and a third one is visual arts 
and creative arts. So I focused on that, and I always drew, um, I always drew like stories of the war, the struggle, the civil war I grew up in, and I would create my own uh, newspaper with sort of like a storyboarding what's happening every day in in different parts of Lebanon. The, the bombs, the war, the killing, and the, the Red Cross rushing and all that. So I would storyboard all these events. And then I discovered Mad Magazine. <laughs> well, how old were you? How old were you during this time? It, I mean, it, uh, uh, since from birth until 18. So the war started when I was maybe um, 11. But we still, you know, <clears throat> went on with our lives. Um, so I spent my teenagehood during that uh, war uh, time, the civil war in Lebanon. And at that time I was creating and, and uh, doing all these uh, kind of graphic novels, uh, hand drawn on paper, and then eventually start to work more towards the fine art mm -hmm. part. And I joined the Academy of Fine Art in Beirut for one year, but then the war started getting worse. So <clears throat> I had to leave uh, after the Academy of Fine Art uh, which was very uh, a tough year. Uh, I had to leave. I left uh, Tripoli, where I'm from, and went to Beirut and, and studied there for one year um, at the academy. And it was a very um, serious training in uh, drawing and painting and traditional um, traditional application to uh, media and techniques and everything. It was in a really in a, in a, in a, powerful I mean it's a good it was a good experience and also there's a lot of um, uh, classes that I took there in uh, design and architecture I haven't even heard of illustration at that stage uh, until I went to Canada later on and I discovered illustration as a field by itself I used to think it's more like fine arts and and then graphic design those are the two different ones I've been noticing, I've been listening to um, sort of older radio broadcasts and interviews with illustrators and fine artists. I've been reading a bunch of articles, biographies of illustrators in the past, and and illustration wasn't really called illustration. Yeah, uh, I studied in French, so it used to be called art plastique. Art plastique is, is fine art, and then uh, art décoratif. <clears throat> art décoratif is decorative art. And mainly those are the two main ones, uh, art plastique, art decorative. Art plastique would be more gallery uh, work, and art decorative would uh, encompass as graphic design, uh, like Art Nouveau kind of idea, uh, and uh, decorative patterning, and, and all the all the design element. But yeah, there was no illustration at the time when I was studying, actually, um, in the late 80s. Did you have family support? In regards, with regards to your art, sort of artistic endeavors? At the beginning, no. My father is a, a, a businessman who has uh, businesses in Africa, in Ghana. This is where I was born, actually, in Ghana. And then I you know, moved to Lebanon when I was two. And so he really wanted me to uh, take over and, and work with him. <laughs> uh, and I, and I, was, I was very resistant. Uh, <laughs> me too. He kept telling me, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was actually you know saying you know move back, move to to Ghana and and you know, I'll teach you about the business side of things and you will be very comfortable financially, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I now I really wanted to pursue. First, I wanted to get into um, uh, documentary filmmaking and taking taking my um, storyboards and graphic novel into film, and then. Uh, uh, and, and I, I studied that at the beginning, uh, filmmaking and script writing, but I loved the storyboarding part and doing flipboards and making small animation with flipboards. So I, I like the, uh, the drawing part of it. So then I discovered design art uh, in Montreal. So I, 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 I uh, you know, I enrolled in a design art program in Concordia University in Montreal. And that's when eventually, after graduating, or while graduating, I think third, fourth year, I discovered that there's such a thing as illustration. It was, it was 1992 at the time, where the first time I heard of illustration, really. I think through American Showcase, 
went to the library and I saw those annuals. It's like, wow, there's so many amazing people who are doing what I'd like to do all in a book. And it's called American Showcase. So I, I ordered one and, and I discovered like what is different uh, master's degree in illustrations that are offered by different universities in Canada and the U.S. And that's how I got into it. When I think about illustration, early 90s, and I think about your work, your own illustration work today, mm-hmm. I, I can't help to see uh, a Brad Holland connection or even a, a Mark English connection. Where, who were your early, who were those illustrators who introduced you into the field? Uh, the, uh, I, I liked, uh, I used to, the, we are, obviously, the, the way we connect with other illustrators was through annuals. There was no Instagram and, and internet and all that. God forbid. And I, I remember, um, I really liked uh, Jack Onro's work uh, I liked his, uh, you know, inking technique and mark making technique, and Ralph Steadman uh, and uh, Alan Cover, and then Joe Chardello. These people were inkers, and I always, I always loved that technique. And I was also, you know, a big admirer of uh, French graphic novel. I used to read a lot of French graphic novels. Um, Mobius and Bilal and uh, also Milo Menara, uh, Italian, um, you know, graphic novelist. And uh, so anything that has to do with ink line was uh, attractive to me in terms of like the, uh, the drawing uh, more than the painting. Mm-hmm. And actually for my thesis, uh, I interviewed Jack Andro, Alan Cover, and, and Joe Chardello. That was like a 90... Uh, two nine three. I, I I interviewed them by by sending them letters by mail <laughs> with my questions, and they send me back the reply. <laughs> you know, not through a dove or or crow, but just by mail. And <laughs> it was interesting. So I wrote my entire thesis on like the their their work and how it influenced my work at the time. So let's talk a little bit about that. So you obviously are you are an illustrator, and uh, your work deals with contours, powerful sort of imagery. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of. I mean, I think uh, th- those contours eventually vanished and they were replaced by shapes. And, uh, and now my work uh, is more about the, uh, a concept and mostly using those shapes in a form of a uh, human anatomy or in, in a form of forms mixed together. Uh, to create the, to actually to to uh, translate visually my concept, uh, and and less is more really. So my instead of you know going used to do more like line details and uh, inking, uh, hatching and all that. Uh, evolve my work evolved from linear to uh, shape and design. It, I guess line uh, drawing became design, and so I would use those design forms with. <clears throat> abstracted or, you know, humorous related to uh, human anatomy as a vehicle almost to translate an idea. Uh, and that's where I became more involved in ideas and whether it's humanistic or political or cultural uh, ideas that I'm trying to convey through my work. And it became more um, Minimal, like I said, and based on shape and color. But I'd also, I, I think the medium changed. So when I would use more, uh, almost like shapes from Photoshop and texture that I create. Um, actually, there's a, there was a stage that, that I went through between the line art and between the design now, which is a lot of watercolor. So I did for like a whole maybe eight, nine years, my work was more kind of more tra- uh, traditional watercolor with uh, a lot of line and and shapes interconnected but and eventually I abandoned watercolor and started working mostly in Photoshop using mostly design like right now it's purely design based and but concept oriented like a lot of visual metaphors did you experience success early on like did you you discovered illustration it's the early 90s you're getting into the field. Yeah. You decide I'm yeah. gonna make a I'm gonna make a go at this. 
Yeah. How did you start? So, yeah, uh, yeah, good question. So, I studied. I, I went to for master's degree in illustration, and my parents were like, "Don't do it. You know, don't do it. Do something completely different. Like, what, what are you gonna do? You gonna draw for a living?" I said, "Exactly that. I'm gonna draw for a living." And uh, and so I I applied to different universities, um, and the the SCAD, which is where I work now, Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, offered me a scholarship. Uh, based on my portfolio and I was like uh, fine then I'll you know I'll take whatever I can get so I uh, did the, my master's degree there I graduated in 94 and then went back to Montreal uh, all I had is printout color printout of my project that we did in class so I kind of chose the best maybe 12 to 15 pieces that I thought will get me some work I made color copies and I put them in a traditional portfolio with like plastic sleeves and then moved to Montreal. Uh, I had a bit of money, lived in a small apartment and um, looked literally looked in the yellow, there was yellow pages, you know, the yellow pages with all the phone numbers, the commercial yellow pages and the white, the white pages are for uh, sort of like individuals. So I looked in the yellow pages <laughs> under publishing houses <laughs> uh, and also under advertising agencies and I and in the yellow pages you have phone numbers and you also have addresses so I would take down the address and then I made a promo card in black and white only because I couldn't afford the colors I made like those uh, I went to a print shop and I made a, a like an accordion type promo card which shows uh, eight pieces as an accordion that you can fold it and it didn't cost me much it was like a uh, hundred dollar for a thousand copy on a cardstock mm -hmm. but it was black and white so I it was like a really great deal so I folded each one of them and then I would write down the address on the envelope and send it to all every each and every uh, art director in Toronto and in Montreal that was my market but you didn't uh, know the art director's then, names Right, you just knew the publisher no, no. and their address. I would send it to the publisher, attention art director. There was no name, there was no letter, nothing. I would just send it, send it, send it, thinking that you know, one time someone's gonna open it and say, okay, well, let me call this right. guy. That black and white, that black and white mailer will end up making it to the that art director. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and um, what else I did? I um, yeah, and then I would call. I would call, forget it, I couldn't even get to the advertising agency, but the publishers, there was a lot of publishing houses in Montreal who would do, you know, picture books and French immersion picture books, like English to French or textbooks as well. So I would call them up and, and go see them, the ones who would take my call and go and take my portfolio. It was really tedious. I and mean, if you can imagine the snow and the winter, taking buses with my portfolio and you know, and then um, so I, I would visit them and maybe I contact out of 100 people that I contacted, I was able to get uh, six or seven interviews. And then I remember my very first gig uh, was from Maison Urtubis, which is a publishing house, HMH Urtubis in Montreal. They saw my work and they said, uh, well, we have this uh, book. Um, I forgot the name. It was uh, it was anyway. It was like a like a it was like a paperback book like a ma with by, from a series, and they wanted me to illustrate the cover and few other black and white inside because I had black and white. And I said, "What well, can you do color?" I said, "I can do color. I'll show you the color." He says, "Great." So the, so so the next thing I know, I'm I'm doing this and I'm panicking, like, "Oh my god, this is for real. They're paying me for it." <laughs> and doing my research and. Uh, and so it worked, you know, it, it, it was fine. They, they liked the work and they, they start giving me more series, more books in that particular series. I end up doing maybe about eight or nine of them. Uh, but my biggest gig was for the um, another publishing house where I went there. What's it called? The Edition. Uh, it's called Edition Arimage, which is in Montreal as well. They, for some reason, they found the work that I was doing very practical, and they had those two very large um, 
the, in terms of visual information books to be illustrated, they were textbooks. <clears throat> and, and, and each one had maybe close to 80, 90 illustrations of various different topics. And they're mostly his, history, geography, recipes, and everything for kids who are going to study uh, English in, in a French school. So it was heavily illustrated. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and then they said, um, can you do it? I remember very well. Can you do it for 14,000? And I wrote down, I, I couldn't believe someone was going to pay me 14,000 to do two books. It was 7,000 each book. And I wrote down 1,400 on a paper. And the guy saw me writing down 1,400. And, and I said to him, I said, it sounds good. I'll, I'll think about it. I, I think it's it's gonna work. <laughs> and he said, "Wait a minute! I just told you fourteen thousand. You wrote one thousand four hundred, and you're telling me it sounds good." <laughs> and I was so embarrassed because <laughs> I, I was excited, like someone's gonna pay me. <laughs> wow! And it ended up being it, it's like a, it took me about I think eight months or, or nine months or so to finish both books on fourteen thousand, which is nice, but. I then I realized, wow, I need to do more yeah. work, but I couldn't take any other job because they were heavily illustrated. Do you? Uh, but there was a lot of rejection, also. You know, it's it's not always. I mean, these are the two jobs that I got at the beginning, uh, but there were a lot of projects where you know I would send my portfolio and say, no, we're looking for someone who does more realism. We were it really helped me is to join the Association of Illustrators of Montreal of Quebec, actually. Uh, it's still there and I bought pages in their tiny annual so more people start to look at my work from the annual um, now this is before this, you I, don't have a website right oh no there was no, no website. website I had a fax machine I had a fax machine and I had what, uh, my tools and, what's, a, what's a fax machine and I it. yeah exactly <laughs> and I would I would send my sketches through a fax machine to the art director <laughs> and back, you know so but, um, yeah, that, we're, we're talking 1994, 95, 96. Those are when I started, like those three years focusing on illustration. Uh, then I bought a page in the Creative Source, which is the Canada version of uh, the annual here, like the directory. Uh, it was super expensive, I remember. And I bought two pages. I was like, I, I took all the money that I got and I bought two pages, like spread. And I was so nervous about it because it's like uh, a big investment. Do you remember how much it cost? It was something like 1500 or so per, per page. page. 1500 it's, per, per page. page in 94. It was, it was 1994. It's called Creative Source. I don't know if it exists anymore. A creative Source. Uh, and I remember the, uh, the um, marketing person, she was really persuasive. She said, you know, it's worth it. You put money in it. I know you just graduated. It's been two years you're working in the field. <clears throat> and, but it, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a good investment. So I did. And then I called some of the artists in that source book to ask them, have you guys made your money back from the source book? I called a few of them. And one of them was the husband of the marketing person who sold me the uh, <laughs> who sold me and the he page. said, yeah, totally. And, do it. And, he, and I didn't know. He didn't tell of me. Not. Uh, and he said, and wait, and he said, uh, no, absolutely. I, I totally will, will think this is a good investment. And by the way, you know, you just moved to Montreal and we're all illustrators. Let me invite you over for dinner. So he invited me with my ex-wife at the time. We went to his house for dinner and the marketing director happened to be his wife. She was there waiting for us. And I was like, oh my God, is this a trap? <laughs> We we uh, it would they turned out to be a very nice okay. couple, you know. Obviously, she, she wanted to sell me the idea of, of buying an annual, and he you know he wanted to show me his work, and he was like a compulsive uh, illustrator. He would draw anything he sees in front of him. So um, I, I I'm glad that she didn't she didn't welcome you into her home and say uh, allow me to interest you in uh, this other three thousand dollar <laughs> per page. Yeah, yeah, like she was really good with marketing and she really helped me and you know, introduced me to a lot of people actually. Eventually, it, sh it paid off. I think there were a few gigs, but the biggest thing that I got from it was an, an agency. Uh, it's called Three in a Box, which is now in, based in Toronto and is still active. And Three in a Box contacted me and said, uh, Would you like to sign with us and we'll rep you? 
And I automatically said, yeah, rep me because I'm just tired of looking at yellow pages and, and meeting people and do that. So, and they especially said, you know, bring you more work from the United States and, and different parts who are mostly focusing on, uh, on the UK, USA and Canada. So they started repping me and, and that really helped, um, that, but I, you know, I had to also promote, like we, we had to promote, we had to pay to promote. So it was like, oh shit, every money, every money that I'm making, and I have to put it back into promote. And if you don't participate, it's like, okay, fine, don't participate. You know, the other guy participated and got many gigs because yeah. of this. And so, and you feel like you feel like you feel bad. So it's like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll I'll participate in the card. And so they would pay thirty percent or the twenty five percent, and we pay eighty five percent because that was the ratio of the. So they they would they would take a commission twenty five percent from each job, but then, which means they will uh, contribute their own 25% for the promotion. So we, I would do it every six months, we would do cards and they will do mailers on our behalf. Uh, and they go to conferences and distribute the mailers. There's a lot of that with Trina sure. Box. So I stayed with them for a while. Well, let's talk about, um, let's talk about agencies actually, uh, because you are the founder and creative director of Illozoo. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the internet told me so, so I, I'm going to go ahead and believe it. No, that's right, and I, you're right. I'm I'm just uh, I'm just thinking of how it sounds. Like and that's not how many people say it like that, but it sounds good. <laughs> I'll say uh, so. But you I, are I, yeah. I'll say it one more time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it didn't start that way. It really started. Well, let me tell uh, tell me about that. So so <laughs> you are. I mean, Illo Zoo, For for those who who don't know, and I imagine there's only a, there, you know. Many people who know the Illazoo is one mm -hmm. of—I I would say it's fair to say—the one of the largest art agencies around. Mm -hmm. Period. How did yeah. you start that agency? How does one start an agency? Oh gosh, um, there's really there's no book about this, but um, the the uh, idea started with uh, a class I was giving at, at SCAD. And I was telling them, my student, I said, you know, I keep giving you those projects and you guys create them based on the specifications that I give you. I think you should, I should give you project, real projects. And, um, you know, maybe connecting with art directors and connecting with, you know, magazines and newspapers or anybody, even businesses who are in need of illustration. And let's turn these into our project in the classroom. Uh, and at least we can interact. You can get your feedback from me, but also mostly from the client. And it's fun. You can see this project actually out in the market and in publication. So then I start to think about maybe I should um, start my own kind of like gallery. And uh, and at the time when I, it was 2013, that was maybe after 15 years or so of teaching. I had, you know, I keep in touch with some of my students uh, as alumni. So I said, I'm going to create a gallery of top notch 15 kick ass illustrators that I know uh, from my, from some of my students and some of them are the one I'm going to reach out to. So I contacted these students that I uh, that graduate and I said, I'm going to build a gallery and I'm going to call it illazoo.com. And, and then I'm going to see what happens if people are going to notice you and I'm going to promote it and, you know, show it to different people. But we'll see. I just want to create that, curate that gallery. So um, they said, yes, yeah. so they sent me their work. And, and I also looked into the uh, New York Society of Illustrators annual and American illustration uh, and also the Bologna Children Book Fair. And I picked names of artists that I like and I emailed them. I said, uh, I'm a professor but I want to put together, I want to create a gallery uh, just so you can, I can show your work uh, to the public and see if people are interested and people could notice it and commission you for work. Uh, there, and there was no contract yet or anything. It was mostly like I wanted to create that gallery. So I put it together and more people start to notice. Um, and I, I you know, build a Facebook page and Instagram and everything. 
And then I realized, wow, wait a minute, this is happening now that where even people are calling uh, from from different parts of the world uh, asking if this person is available or if they want to commission them for something. And then it started to become slowly an agency um, where, where you still have to put together a contract and figure out how to do it and figure out how to promote. Um, so it's it started really small, like anything else, honestly. And it started mainly because I was really passionate about that gallery that I want to put together, uh, more than trying to make a living. I know it sounds corny. It wasn't really. It wasn't for the money at all that I started. It was mainly. It was mainly because I wanted to do something outside the classroom and celebrate those beautiful illustrations, and I want people to see them together. Like I want to curate it. Uh, and I didn't have a gallery, an actual gallery, and I figured online I'm going to do it and put together a Facebook page. And more and more people start to notice it, and that's how I, you know, it grew. I imagine it's not, uh, I imagine a lot of it is fun, obviously. There's, you're dealing with art on a daily basis, and so much of it is quite lovely. But there are, yeah. are I suspect, elements of running Yellow Zoo that aren't so fun. Yeah, it's the money part. That's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> the money and uh, the payment and the wires and the PayPal and the disc, the uh, the fees and all that. And also, no, I mean, it's it's. I'm a very very organized person. I have to give myself this. Like I'm organized in a sense that you give me something complicated and I would dissect it into simple elements and I can Which... take those elements and designate it to different people who can understand those elements and run with it. Uh, so it, things start to get more complex. I mean, right now there are about 200 artists, designers, animators, photographers, and some of them are studios that we represent. Those studios are like, you know, motion graphics or animation studios. So managing all these artists uh, takes a lot of energy, not just uh, in terms of managing, like curating their work, but also you know, updating their work and listening to them what they need, and listening to also the clients what they need and putting them in touch with each other. Uh, also, when the project is created, the, the creative process supervising it and sometimes it turned into a beautiful thing. Like yesterday, the most beautiful piece, we created a book for it uh, and the publisher was like raving how happy they were. And sometimes it's like the client is, this is this, this is just disappointing. I, you know, totally, this guy is totally unprofessional. And I, and or sometimes the artist will call me and say, you know, you introduced me to the worst client ever. Like, why would this happen? I didn't think this is going to happen. They keep asking for revisions or whatever it is, the situation. So I'm always listening to people either praising each other through us or just saying this sucks. I wish you didn't introduce us to each other. And and I'm listening to that in different languages and different cultures yeah. and different uh, <laughs> age group and, and everything, personalities. So that this is the part, this, this, this is like the human, the, most more like the human interaction part. So you have the creative part, you have the human interaction part, and then you have the marketing part and the promotion. Normally, I don't do marketing and promotion because I hate to sell you something. I, I hate that I will tell you to buy something from me and you don't and you ignore me. And I hate that. So I would. So I would. I would. And I'm really not very good at selling, I guess. Uh, I, I have um, um, agents who are working for us who are much better than I am at speaking very smoothly to our directors and our buyers and and selling them their you know their creativity uh i'm much better at uh, kind of managing the artists and try to listen to them and hopefully and mainly like you know uh, overseeing creating the uh the artwork uh so otherwise if i'm not organized and i and you know i i recognize people like everybody has each person has a skill set so i recognize those skill set in whether they are my agents or you know other people we work with uh and then i and i give them those responsibility and because they are good at whether it's communication or and something else uh they excel with it so i don't need to do everything i just need to recognize the good skills and people and appreciate it and trust them that they will do their job because 
it's designed for them kind of thing. Speaking of recognition, uh, do you, do you recognize <laughs> what is it about the industry that you recognize when you think about it in terms of what it was like back in the early nineties and what it's like today? Is it a totally different beast or are there elements of it that you recognize from your early, early endeavors in, in, in the field? Yeah, I mean, certain things are always standard. The need to create an image, whether you want to sell a product or you, you want to uh, advertise a product or you want to advertise a cause or illuminate text or illustrate an article, is, and the need for someone to create that and for you to give them directions and then pay them for their job is the same formula. What changed really is that uh, those art buyers or art directors had access to a, a, a very like a limited circle of artists. Let's say here in the United States, so you had you know those big ones like Gary Kelly or Seymour Seymour Quast, um, C.F. Payne, or else like Brad Holland, all these guys who were like always like gold medal uh, in the New York Society and. Uh, but there were uh, there were Gary Kelly's and Seymour Quast in the Philippines and in, in New Zealand and in South America that no one had heard of, and they were as good. Uh, so now you hear of them. Now you, the, the, you now there's like an amazing 21 year old uh, illustrator who can kick ass the, anybody who would get the gold medal in New York society. And they're on Instagram and people know about them and you can reach out to them and hire them. So there's much more, uh, much more competition, obviously, and there's much more choices. And illustration also is changing because it's becoming a uh, multi-platform. There was no web uh, content before. It was mainly for print, like print advertising, packaging, books, magazine, etc. right? And, and, and slowly, it be, the, the, the platform change, you have games, you have apps, you have visual development for them, you have web content, you have motions and GIFs, you know, you put something on the, on, on the paper and then you can also create a GIF for it, a motion for it on, online, for the online version of the, of the magazine or newspaper or whatever. And then you have a lot, you have the, the, the non-for-profit organizations or or banks or institution or cultural societies they all have they all need web content and web graphics not just infographics or motion graphic but they they need illustrations or motion to uh, either attract people's attention to their content uh, or illustrate the ideas so there's a big renaissance for illustration there's a there's, there's a more artists that are being exposed internationally and competing with North American artists, but then also there's much more platform. That's why you have you have all the illustration department in every art school today. They're flooding with students who want to study illustration seriously. So illustration, like in your view, is alive and well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely alive and well. More than. It's it's diff it's it's a wider spectrum right now. More platform, more people doing it. I think even s slowly it will turn into the word. That, that's why I, I sometimes use visual communication to say illustration, but it's turning into multi-platform. You can draw and paint and design and collage and montage and CGI over you know picture. It's it uh, it's it's all turning into the same thing. It's image making or or telling story visually. So it's kind of maybe maybe the the word illustration slowly could change. I'm not sure. But when people think of illustration, a lot of time they would think of like you know pen and ink and and drawing and mm -hmm. painting and sort of like you know picture books. Well, and you go now and say visual communication. I think you sell it better. You sell the idea of drawing and painting and visual storytelling better. Uh, I think terminologies are changing. Uh, platforms are changing. There's more access to artists. And there's more amazing artists now that existed before, but no one had heard of them because there was no internet that all merging and, and you know, 
being seen right. everywhere. I'll give you I'll give you a real real quick sort of um, anecdote, and then I want to talk a little bit about. You just said the illustration is alive and well. I agree. I know there are people listening to this saying, well, if illustration is alive and well, and if there are so many more clients and so many other ways of connecting with me, why aren't I getting any work? So we're going to, we're going to talk about that in a second, but I'll give you a quick little kind of anecdote, uh, that yeah. speaks to the before and after the internet before, when I used to work okay. at Simon and Schuster many years ago, we would receive physical portfolios with the plastic sleeves, like very much yeah. like the one that you put together back in the nineties and the portfolios would come in, people would drop them off and we would have an office manager who would put a slip on the portfolio with every art director's name on it. And there would be lines, each line correlated to how the art director would react to the art. Meaning first column was, I love it. I'm going to hire you. Second column was, I love it, but it's not right for me. Third column yeah. was, it's not for me. And that was mm. that plus agents for the most, what yeah. I th I would say covered 98% of the illustration needs of one of the major publishers. Then the internet came around and yeah. all of a sudden you can find that Seymour Quast from the Philippines. You could, you could find someone who wasn't, who didn't have physical access to New York city or to any other major city. Yeah. So that's just yeah. sort of how it goes. And, and, and I've heard people say, well, it, now that art directors and art buyers have access to illustrators around the globe, what chance do I have? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's overwhelming. It doesn't mean it, it's, it, it doesn't mean that it's not alive and well, there, there's so much work there, but it's overwhelming even for the art directors to choose the right person because of those options. It's like going to a cheesemonger and buying cheese and this cheesemonger has 20 selections of 20 different cheeses. And it's very easy. You go there calmly as an art director or a cheese lover. You buy your own cheese, you taste it, and you pick the one you like, and you go home. Now it's like um, it's like a Sam's Club. Now it's like a Sam's Club with nothing but cheese <laughs> and dairy product and like all different things. And while you're looking for cheese and dairy product, you also discover a different type of product that tastes like cheese, but it's not really dairy. And it's it's uh, and a different prices and some of them are important some of them are local, mm -hmm. and you're overwhelmed and you might because you're overwhelmed you might choose the wrong make the wrong decision, uh, or uh, or just walk out or just walk yes out. or you might go back to what you know so you might you're overwhelmed so you decide you know what I'm just gonna hire that illustrator that I was I had drinks with on Friday at the you know illustration yeah, party. Yeah. And that's a frustration that I hear from a lot of illustrators. I live in Mon I live in well, Montana. I don't have op I don't have the opportunity to go to L.A. or New York. I don't have the money to travel to go to these parties or these conferences. All I have is the internet or postcards. Yeah. See, the thing is, okay, yeah, uh, you're right, but also that's dependent on the personality of those art directors and art buyers, whoever hires, some people want to take that chance on a new person. Some people enjoy the fact that there's so many choices and they're overwhelmed and they want to like discover the new big thing. And some of them say, you know what, this is a headache. I'm just going to hire the guy that I already know. <clears throat> but this happens. This happens uh, also within the internet itself. But the, part of the problem other illustrators are having too is how to reach to begin with, this art director. And I find email is the weakest way to reach anybody on earth. The, the, the least reliable way to show your work to a person who you want them to hire you for any reason, any, any, any job, is through an email. So now the artist is saying, well, maybe I should go to the society's uh, meeting or reception or the American illustration, uh, or I should go to a conference or I should go to Bologna fair or to Frankfurt book fair or the, any book fair or any, you know, conference that relate to 
uh, animation or, or and meet people there? And the answer is yes. That's the only way to do it these days because we as an agent, the same thing. At the beginning, it was like, okay, we'll con connect with people through LinkedIn, through email, even if we know their names and we they don't have to, people don't feel so obligated to answer every email. But we had to, we decided, I think it's better to nurture our relationship and to meet people and to communicate with them and face to face because, because that's the best way to connect. Uh, just because you, it could be two different artists with the same style or same quality of work. One is sending an email, the other guy made the effort and went to a conference and met with the art director and had a conversation and talked more about in depth about their work. They will connect better and there's more chance of the other guy who went to a conference to get that job. So whether you're in Montana or Kathmandu or whatever, they need to be involved in gatherings, uh, meet, you know, like conferences and then go back home and work. They don't have to be living in a big city right. anymore. And it's not like you have to go to every single one every single time. No, no, no. There's some good ones and there's some, it all depends. Like, you know, that's one thing. The second thing is illustrator, illustrators don't think that the work is only going to come from art directors or art buyers or creative directors. There's so many different ways and platforms for businesses, corporation, whether they're like multi-million business industry or, or a small business, actually even it's more likely that it will happen through small businesses first that they will connect with them whether they want to do uh, web content or whether they want to create uh, merchandising or uh, you know project to promote their businesses uh, packaging you know what I mean like uh, it, th there are ways to uh, they, they, I mean they, they should be connecting to those businesses I mean it could be local businesses or it could be you know, national businesses. And it's not only coming directly, it doesn't have to always come from ad agency or publishing house, like an art director or creative director. You know, if they have some marketing sense and some business sense, and sometimes you have to be you know, a sociable person, those things help you to show your work to the right people uh, and sell the idea, pitch the idea that you need my image. A picture is worth a thousand words. I'll be able to have your crowd listen to you more if you show them that picture or that you know package your brand better uh, and there's so many platforms i you know uh, beyond that so that's another another thing bruno minari said something to the effect you don't you don't just think about you know the small group of um, high profile clientele you think about the local business it, and he and he, he and then he sort of uh, ended it with like if you can meaning like is it either, it's not that easy it's not it's not uh, a less than opportunity to do a, a logo or an illustration for somebody local for somebody smaller than you know Simon and Schuster or whomever but let's yeah. so how do you a put together a mailing list that will bear fruit and b promote yourself so you you do separate yourself to some degree from the global network of illustrators that art directors now can tap into. All right. So before before the email and the promo cards and all that, you have to look at your work and see if your work is um, answering the market. It's a supply and demand, right? So if you're going to be going to Simon Schuster or a publishing house and you, you want to work in this domain, look at the fact that you graduate from school and you have 4.0 GPA or everybody thinks you're amazing means nothing. You need to look at your work and see if there is a visual cohesiveness and that you're solving problems with it. A lot of time, I, I get I get maybe, I don't know how many hundreds of emails from illustrators who want to, they either, you know, asking me, they want to join or they're, you know, saying that, you know, give me feedback, see if I can improve myself or whatever. And their work is either uh, an imitation or their work, an imitation with like lower, lower quality because whoever they're imitating already moved on and they're doing better work in terms of craftsmanship. 
uh, or their work is not solving any problems. They're drawing the same topics more or less different ways. Uh, or their work is a combination of different artists all in one portfolio. All these three are mistakes. Like no one wants to work with an artist that has multiple different approaches. Uh, it's confusing. Unless you're working in-house, that's a different story. No one wants to work with an imitator unless it's a cheap business who want, cannot afford the guy who does it better. And, um, and people want to work with illustrators who have ideas, a variety of ideas, especially in editorial or, you know, um, especially editorial. Like you want to see, and I want to see if you, you're talking about, you know, um, interpreting concepts that relate to the variety of topics and uh, narrative or metaphoric or whatever. But I want to see ideas. I'm interested in your ideas. And so if you eliminate these three, I mean, I would say half the illustrators today are, are, are like that. They're either imitators or they're repeating what, what uh, or have a variety of different mm -hmm. styles and they can't make up their mind and they want the client to make up their mind for them or, or they don't have ideas. Mm -hmm. I think these, th this is even before promoting yourself. So the first thing that these guys, the artists who are, or illustrators who are saying, well, I'm struggling, well, have a look at your work and see how you connect with the market that you're showing your portfolio to. Why would they want to hire you? Do you have something new? Do you have ideas or storytelling abilities that are different? Is your craftsmanship cohesive? Are you, are you able to to show a variety of compositions and topics, but with a very unique and cohesive work that hasn't been imitated over and over many times. And then once you, if your answer is yes to all this, then you start thinking, well, now I'm gonna go to a conference, I'm gonna show my portfolio, I'm gonna send my promo card, and I'm gonna send email to specific art directors that I met at that conference, I'm gonna put a LinkedIn page, I'm gonna make my sure my website looks good and well curated, and they will get work. They will get work. For, it's easy for, for people to blame, well, you know, I did my job, I have a portfolio now, and no one's calling me. But sometimes you need someone to show you why, beyond the fact that, well, the market is saturated and our directors are busy. You, you have to not just, you have to be able to, to know that you, you, how your weaknesses and your strength and focus on your strength and stop looking at other people's work on Instagram uh, and say, well, I can uh, do that. I'm going to try yep. it, you know? Bring something new to the table. Yeah. That's, that's the problem. I want to go back to something that you said that I completely disagree with. Mm -hmm. The multiple styles thing. Mm-hmm. I, I just I have the, to say the, I I dis I think I know what you're saying. Uh, yeah. I will, but I say you know when illustrators ask me about that, I tell them if you do yeah. multiple things well, organize them yeah. well on your website and best wishes to you and go forward with it. You don't do you not yeah. agree with that? It depends if you're seeking work. Okay, as a freelancer, as a freelancer. Uh, it, it, <clears throat> I think it confuses the, like, for, for example, <clears throat> with my agency, uh, every, every gallery or every artist has its own series of work that they do. And sometimes I have to split them into different names or to different galleries to separate them completely from each other. Uh, if you're going to hire someone <clears throat> because of their particular style and then you go to their website, and it's not organized. I say if you do vector art, flat vector art, but also you do uh, semi-realistic, semi-painterly work. And you say, okay, this is my vector style and this is my painterly style. I can go to your website and say, okay, I, I want you to work on your vector style. I want to hire you for this, right? But why should I do that? Why can't I just go to this guy who that's all he does is vector and has more example of vector art? Why should I hire the guy who does both? Well, maybe there's so many different factors. Maybe the guy who does both is a nicer guy, or maybe he's more flexible, and the guy who does vector on his own, and that's all he does, he's really too busy, and he's known for this. There are different factors. But what I'm saying is, when you have competition, the ones who stand out are the ones who have a, 
a variety of ideas and a variety of topics to be resolved, and they're they're less they're they're not um, experimenting too much with the way they're designing or drawing because they had mastered a certain technique, and now they're spending more energy into their ideas. When you have several different techniques, you might be an amazing a juggler, and you can you can apply different approaches and different, I guess, technique to your work. But I, I find it personally, and I, I might be wrong, that it confuses people. Now, if I want to hire someone in-house, and I want someone who can do whatever, storyboard and vector mm-hmm. art and some motion, some painterly, whatever, like someone like a jack of all trade, I would love to hire someone who can do everything, because these are like five illustrators in right. one. I, I, I don't know. I guess maybe it's somewhere in between if you if you know it, how to be able to label or show certain portfolios to certain people. Like part of the problem also is showing the wrong. Even if your work is absolutely fantastic, showing it to the wrong client or the ones who like do your homework. The uh, the the students should do their homework before they connect with the uh, client. Is like, this is the aesthetic that they're looking for? or the subject matter they're looking for. Maybe that's part of the problem as well. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about connecting to the client really really quickly. The mailing lists. So this is a question yeah. I get asked all the time. How do I put together a mailing list? And again, my answer is it needs to be dusted off because it's about 15 years old at this point. It's uh, For me, it's 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 almost, I, I almost, when I, th- when I answer that question, I recall teachers from RISD in the, late 90s saying almost word for word the same thing. You look up who the art directors are, you put together a spreadsheet of some kind and you keep it updated. You go to the bookstore, you look at you look at the copyright pages, you look at the mastheads of magazines, that sort of thing. Yeah. Now you do that plus you follow them on social media. How yeah. else, you know, what is so uh, imagine you're you're talking to an illustrator who has never put together a mailing list in their life. What is your yeah. several sentence suggestion to them in terms of like how to start I putting got, together a mailing list? I got nothing from mailing list. I paid for my mailing list and nothing worked. Uh, like it was one of those mailing lists with five, 6,000 people in advertising and 20,000 in um, uh, publishing, blah, blah, blah. It's like, forget it. It, it, it didn't work for us. I mean, at least for me, for the agency, it didn't work. Uh, we we started to handpick people we want to work with, and we focus on on very few people. Uh, it was overwhelming. A mailing list of twenty thousand that you buy from you know all these agencies, and it. So we decided to. I mean, LinkedIn was a good start for us. After that, we went to LinkedIn and we we put up, you know, cleaned up our profile and we reached out to different individuals. And I found uh, sending an email through LinkedIn is safer and uh, more than likely it will not end up in spam. Like an email you send, it will not bounce mm-hmm. back. But they're all going to spam. More than likely, 80% of them are going to spam. It won't bounce back, so you wouldn't know. So you're thinking, oh, this guy is ignoring me, but this guy never received your email. LinkedIn, you would know. Uh, first of all, you have to ask someone on LinkedIn and send them an email. And if they ignore you, you would know they ignore you. At least you you did your job. Uh, so we started with uh, with like agency access and all that uh, and did a work. And then uh, we did LinkedIn. And LinkedIn started to work for us on a smaller scale, and we start to nurture the ones who are, are working, like project-wise, they'll give us project, and then we, we become more like repeat business. And actually, I would say a lot of other, the jobs that we are doing are coming from repeat business. I mean, an illustrator doesn't have to work with every single publication uh, from the beginning. And I think, you know, when they first start, it's good to have 25, I tell my students the same thing, like put together a list of 25 Top, you know, with an animation house, like, uh, or or a publishing house, or an ad agency. All the ad agencies is really harder to do uh, for students at the beginning. How do you, how do you find them though? I mean, how do you find? Um... You find them on LinkedIn, like you. I mean, let's just say I want to work with Penguin, or I want to work with a certain company. I would just type the name of the company. It will give me directory. It will give me an art director. Uh, like I would type creative director, art director, and the name of the company. It will give me the names. LinkedIn will do. Will do. Now, I can add them, uh, and they, they can decide to accept or not. 
Uh, or I can say, okay, I'm going to a conference right now, a book fair, and who's there? So give me a list of uh, all the publishers in that book fair, and I would uh, usually you can you can either get that list or pay to go to the conference, and you have access to the list and who's there, and go to the booth, and and meet with them and show them your business card or your promo card and get to know them. But buying it directly. Uh, I don't know if I to answer your question. Like that's how that's how I know who I'm talking to by looking them up. Uh, sometimes the annuals, like if you look at American Illustration or New York Society or, or, or Archive, you can you can see the projects and the name of the art director. So you can Google his or her name and find it. It's it's not. I mean, it's always there. We could talk about marketing <laughs> and uh, and and yeah. reaching out until the cows come home. But I, I wanted to. I wanted to switch gears a little bit here and you know you're imagine you're talking right now to someone who's frustrated and uh, yeah maybe they've been at it for for a few years or more than a few years maybe they've done all the things that they're supposed to be doing maybe they yeah. have gone to the conferences they've met the people they've gone to the shows they've shown their portfolio they put in the work etc nothing's happening so what do you say to that person? So first, you look at the craftsmanship and aesthetic. Second, you look at the subject matter, it's problem solving. And third, you look at the marketability of the portfolio. And if all three of them are working, mm -hmm. okay, and this guy is saying, okay, well, I have my website and I have my portfolio, and um, I did all the work I connected with, uh, art director, that marketing, at promo conference, and all that, and I still cannot find work. Okay, I will, I will dig my head in, on the ground and say, you know what, I'm, I'm a, bit, a big bullshit. It will not happen because if you have a portfolio with all these three criteria and you're doing your work and you're showing your, your port, your, your portfolio around, and you have, you're doing marketing and you're active online, you will get work. There's something wrong in the formula that if you have all these criteria met and you're still not getting work, it's just, it's, it's humanly impossible because, or like a bad omen, like a bad karma. I don't know what it is. You know what I mean? The problem is in our backyard, the solution is in our backyard and we keep looking around and finding the right solution, but maybe a deeper analysis of the portfolio, the subject matter, the quality of work, and mainly who you're showing it to those things are important for them to do at school before they graduate. Like with my students, a lot of them are afraid. They're like, well, you know, I have this project and we're getting A's and everything, but what do you think is gonna happen to us? You, they're not the only one, every school, they're, they're, and they're afraid that they wanna compete, they're gonna be competing with people who are doing animation. Um, the, the, the other problem also, I don't know if I'm deviating or not, but the other problem is the schools are flooded with illustrators that are coming in because of game and entertainment and video games, mm -hmm. computer games and visual development. They, all these kids are coming in because they're gamers. That's what they live for, thinking this is it. And then they realize halfway before they graduate, they're like, wow, there are so many people doing this already and they're way better than us. They're way older than us. They're much more, uh, you know, their work is more complex and more intensive. We're never going to compete with them, but our, the schools are inviting us because of this sexy word, entertainment and gaming. And, and, and it's almost like, what do we do next? It's almost like Universal Studio tells you about all these amazing rides, and you go there and you're standing in line for hours. And you think, well, no one told me I'm going to be standing in line for hours. So these seniors, when they get to this, really realize that, wait a minute, I can admire some amazing Frank Razzetta's there, but I'm not Frank Razzetta, and, but I can do some really cool infographics, and I've been ignoring this. Know yourself and know your strengths and weaknesses and uh, analyze yourself well before committing to that particular market. And, and, I, and I do a lot of these talks with my, my seniors before they graduate, like make sure you understand what you're capable of doing and and not and be yourself and problem solve and and work will come there is a lot of work out there i tell that and that goes back to what you were saying earlier about uh the instagram comparison bug that illustrators catch a lot they'll they'll look at yeah they'll look at other people's work and they'll say well that person's that person is more talented they're i, I don't like the word talented but that person 
uh, does similar, you know, kinds of work that I do. And it, in my view, they do it better and they're more experienced and, and you're just, it's it, that, that to me is a sort of toxic, uh, thought process. It is destructive in many ways because it's, it's, it's one, you're spending time thinking about someone else's work and how successful they are. And you're not spending time doing your own work Two. It's if you if you and a lot of illustrators suffer from this. You spot you start that spiral of well, there's so many other illustrators in the world now, better than I am. But my my anytime I talk to an illustrator about that, my my answer is always the same. You're, they're not you. They are not you. You are not them. They have their ways. You have your ways. You, all you need to do as an illustrator is a yeah. You understand what the market is doing. Understand what other people are doing and enjoy it and f- yeah. and if there are things that other people are doing that you connect with emotionally then tr- f- figure out how to fold that into what you do but don't copy what they're doing and don't think that in order to be successful you have to be <laughs> you have to be a Frank Frazetta and no one could be a Frank Frazetta but you have to be that that kind of person uh, and and they, they they can they the thing is like just to make an example like uh, Olympia Zagnoli an illustrator who's a market illustrator designer uh, she she's been doing this she's she's kind of new in the market since like she started maybe about 10 12 years ago and she's so successful uh, and why she's successful there's so many different factors but she really lived like her 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 what she, like her life is her work and her apartment, the way she thinks, the way she draws, what what she collects is all design, as an example. And and so she's true to herself. She, I'm sure she's very influenced by a lot of different design illustrators. Um, but she's she's uh, and I mean another example like her is Malika Fav. Malika Fav also super talented. And she's true to herself. She's stuck to her guns. She she does her own beautiful kind of shapes, and she focuses on it. There's so many people who imitate her or imitate Olympia Zagnoli or imitate other artists, but they're not as good because they're they're just following. And they they like I said before, they ignore themselves. They ignore their own art. And the thing is, is it's really existential. It's an existential problem. It's not just illustration. It's a, knowing yourself first, your strength and weaknesses and focus on this without blindly following. It causes anxiety when you're just looking at illustrators work all the time on Instagram, especially not knowing their name. Like a lot of my students, I ask them, like, who's this work? And it's like, I don't know, we just found them on Instagram and we love it, we just follow him. And they just follow all these people and and not focus um, on their own self. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a competitive field there, but there's so many platforms and there's so many clients out there. It's just you need to know yourself first, your strength and weakness, and, and do it. To learn more about Muhammad and Ilozu, visit ilozu.com. If you enjoyed our conversation, please share it online, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us a positive rating and review. This helps us find new listeners, and on a personal note, it would be nice to know that the podcast is helping. Continue the conversation in the comments section of each episode at illustrationdepartment.com forward slash podcast. This podcast is produced by the Illustration Department, a global leader in online education for illustrators. Visit us at illustrationdept.com for class offerings, testimonials, the alumni showcase, and more. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.